Behind the Scenes. Conversations with European researchers and innovators. If we go to the Transformers example, you might imagine that it's smoother to see a robot moving its hand in an as smooth and socially nice way as possible than making really uh, sudden gestures and motions which might be safe but not socially acceptable. In this podcast, we'll hear the inspiring stories and journeys of Europe's most brilliant scientists and innovators whose discoveries are having an impact on our daily lives. Here's how they got to where they are. These are our top stories. Our guest today is Dimos Dimaraganis, Professor of Automatic Control at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm in Sweden. He's currently working on the project CO for Robots, an EU-funded project under Horizon 2020, which is exploring better ways to communicate with several robots working collectively or cooperatively. Thank you for being with us today from Sweden. So the aim of this interview is to discover your project, obviously, but also to hear a little bit about how you arrived at it, what and who inspired you. So first off, tell me a bit about your expertise, robotics, computer science, autonomous robotics. It all comes from mathematics, right? Yes, indeed. My background is on robotics and automatic control, and this is my research area, and it is very related to applied mathematics. This is uh, an inclination I had since I started studies as an elementary school student. I preferred math than other courses. Well, let me ask you, though, because when I talk to my young nephew and other young kids, they have this idea of robots. They consider loving to play with robots and they've got an idea of what they are. Is this something you grew up with? I didn't have a, a direct, uh, let's say, relation to playing with robots or uh, being fascinated about uh, robots as I was growing up. It was more, again, my inclination towards math. And then I had this uh, tendency to try applied math instead of pure mathematics. So applied math was more directed to electrical engineering. And again, it was what inspired to study robotics later on. But I wouldn't say I played with toy robots and this inspired the direction I chose. It was more, again, the inclination towards uh, mathematics. You must have had teachers or, or some sort of learning through school that inspired you as well. Again, uh, this was more like a self-driven direction in early years. But in later years, I had some inspirational teachers in Lyceum and high school. Especially my teacher in high school, the way he delivered the course, uh, how to try to be creative through uh, knowledge of mathematics and not just learning things by heart, was really inspirational to me. And this was a decisive factor to choose the study path later on, on electrical engineering. I like this idea of creativity in mathematics, but tell me a bit more about your current project. What was the starting point of your work? What led you to become a researcher? The project came at a later stage, but at an earlier stage, I would say that studying then electrical engineering, I became acquainted with uh, automation, with courses on automatic control. This had a really good balance between applied uh, mathematics and engineering applications, in particular in automation. And then the direct relation to robotics was the inspiring factor of doing a PhD in that area. My PhD, it involved how to do navigation of multiple mobile robots. And then as the years passed by and uh, I followed up the postdoc and, and the uh, faculty career, I became more interested in other capabilities of robots apart from mobility, such as transportation, such as picking things and carrying them to certain points. So on manipulation, as we say in robotics and transportation of objects. So this was like the background of what led to this uh, current endeavor in this project. Well, I presume it's a bit more than just stopping robots from bumping into each other. Can you expand on it a little bit? The main feature is that we might have robots uh, in different environments, such as manufacturing facilities, warehouses, or even service robotics facilities, such as offices and other facilities. And there you may have robots that do certain services, either each robot by itself, uh, like uh, moving between two points of interest, or doing it in a collaborative way. They might want to go grasp a table from appropriate points and carry it to a certain other point. So there, the bumping in comes in that you don't want them to break. You want them to stay at safe distances from one another, and you don't want them to uh, crash on top of each other. So, so it is really crucial 
to build such collision avoidance capabilities to robotic systems, either if they are only doing things on their own or if they are doing things in a collaborative way. And there, you want to respect as much as possible the limited resources you have to build such system. And limited resources, again, can be limited communications, limited energy, and a limited sensing that the robots may have. So when someone's controlling these robots, there's obviously a human in the mix. So how do they give them a precise command? This was indeed the starting point of my current research endeavors. I became really interested in this problem. And then on how humans can give commands to robots in a user-friendly way. And then I became acquainted with some uh, methodologies from computer science, in particular formal verification languages. This type of methods have the property that someone can give commands to robots using natural language, in particular structural language, structural English it was when this started. Of course, there is a software and hardware aspect in between, but the point is that we can build user-friendly interfaces for the user to give these commands by simple language tools. And when I started this uh, research, there was almost nothing out there on multiple robots operations. And this is what inspired this and other EU projects I I have been uh, running as coordinator. I'm coordinator of this project, Co for Robots, that just ended. So this is a research idea I'm I'm working on in the last uh, decade, I would say. And how do you see this working in practice? What are the sort of concrete applications of the work? As concrete examples, one can think of uh, uh, flexible manufacturing systems that you would uh, like robots having recurring commands, such as when observing objects of interest, go and collaboratively collect them. And I already now give a structural language example of a command of what I meant with this. And then what you want by flexibility is that if these robots happen to meet other objects of interest or want to avoid obstacles such as human workers in the vicinity, then this should happen in real time. You don't want to reprogram your system. This is what this project has addressed. Online replanning as much autonomous way and without the need of resetting the whole system from scratch once such situations happen. I guess that's a big safety element, especially for Industry 4.0, isn't it? Here, what we address is, apart from having safety as a hard constraint in the system, we also try to address human acceptability, social acceptability of how the system operates. So we want, on the one hand, to have hard constraints on the safety of such systems, such as robots not bumping to each other and not bumping to humans, of course. But at the same time, we aim that robots also behave, I would say, perform in a way that is as human acceptable as possible, as socially acceptable uh, as possible. So, for example, we have features such as if the robot has a parameter that can change the way it moves, its trajectory, as we say uh, technically, then this parameter can be chosen in a way that the resulting trajectory is as close as possible to what the human user would like to see. So you might imagine that if we go to the Transformers example, you might imagine that it's smoother to see a robot moving its hand as in an as smooth and socially nice way as possible than making really uh, sudden gestures and mo- motions which might be safe but not socially acceptable. has changed since you embarked on this career path? How are the automated control systems and robotics perceived as a career? What would you tell a young person who is interested in pursuing this now? When I started and and, uh, didn't have a clear idea of what robotics is about, I thought of it as more focused research area than it really is. In the following sense, that the background that someone needs to have in order to study robotics involves systems and control. And these areas, this in particular systems theory, has such a broad spectrum that one could see robotics as only one, uh, let's say, research uh, side of it and not the only one. Having this perspective helped me a lot in my career to deviate uh, and start uh, looking at other research areas. Uh, One recent one is, for example, uh, neuroscience. I'm trying to apply these tools in such directions. 
And at the same time, it gives me flexibility to go back to robotics problems and see them in a different viewpoint after the different mathematical and engineering tools, if I may say, I have encountered in other research areas of the systems and control theme. What I would uh, answer to someone asking me if it is worth it or what would be my feedback to someone who is interested in studying and doing research in the area is that one can think that this gives many different options. We have students that work uh, in power systems companies here in Sweden, telecommunications, uh, even banking. So I would say, again, robotics is one industrial and research area that one can follow, but there are many more through the systems and control uh, path. And do you have a dream project that you want to work on in the future? I would say there are two, and they are related to some things I'm trying to do now. One is how to use these tools from formal verification and multi-robot systems towards doing flexible assembly robotics, how to have uh, smarter ways in order to assemble pieces of uh, mechanism in a smoother way, and again, having this aspect of online replanning and not needing to do things from scratch if something fails. The other dream project I'm currently trying to work on is a multi-robot systems in space. We are currently exploring possibilities in that area and multi-robot systems, I mean, again, using these tools of flexible uh, planning and control of multi-robot systems for operations in space. So these are two endeavors which I would really like to work on and I hope to get the means in the next years. And is there a European dimension to your work? Yes, I would say that we have a lot of uh, national projects. So sometimes European projects uh, are seen as something that needs extra work instead of being the main pillar. For me, it's the main pillar of my research. I really like, uh, for many reasons, first of all, I learn a lot from my peers in different universities around Europe. And more importantly, it's also the um, social aspect that uh, this has been kind of tuned down due to the COVID situation, but in general, the social aspect, uh, like uh, meeting colleagues, uh, talking about research, exchanging ideas, and also interacting uh, with different people and different cultures is something that is unique, I would say. I don't think there are similar constellations in other parts of the world, at least to the extent that uh, the European Union has been targeting this over the years. We also asked Phil Ayers, our second guest, who is an architect, designer and teacher working on novel building materials, to think of a question to ask you. So he wanted to know, what do you think about the role of robots in society in the future? I think in the near future, they will contribute to better facilities, better ways of working, more jobs further impact in aspects such as digitalization, uh, energy resource optimization, usage, even green economy and environment. In the long-term future, my perspective is that technologies are always great as long as governments (laughs) use them in the right way. So this I cannot, of course, prolong what will happen. But I hope that uh, along the impact lines I just mentioned, that this will continue to grow in that uh, direction, government uh, allowing. (laughs) Of course. Thank you very much. I would now like to ask you what your question is going to be to our next guest, who in this series will be Polona, who is working on marine research studying climate change in the Arctic. What would be your burning question regarding that? Have you a particular question you'd like answered? As a robotics uh, researcher, the main issue in outdoor environments is how we collect data. My question is, how do they collect the data and what uh, type of issues they encounter and how they resolve them? Well, we will put that to our next guest. Thank you very much indeed. It was lovely to talk to you today. Thank you. And of course, more information on your project can be found online. Check the details of this episode for all the links and more information. Do join us again next time on the podcast These behind-the-scenes conversations with Europe's most brilliant scientists and innovators give you an insight into how the EU's investments in research and innovation impact our daily lives. This podcast series is brought to you by the European Commission and you can find it on all listening platforms. If you enjoyed this conversation, rate this podcast on all listening platforms and share it with your friends on social media. 